from Byron, Mississippi, it's Lakeshore Church. Today is with you. It's about rejoicing. And Jesus put it in perspective of how and what we're supposed to rejoice over. And uh, verse 17 uh, through 20 of Luke chapter 10, we find these words. The 72 returned with joy saying, Lord, even the demons submit to us in your name. He said to them, I watch Satan fall from heaven like lightning. Look, I have given you the authority to trample on snakes and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. How much of the power? All the power. Nothing at all will harm you. However, don't rejoice that the spirits submit to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. Let's pray. We thank you, Lord. Uh, my words, my thoughts, Lord, that's what I desire. They'd be yours. And God, for us to walk in obedience today to everything that we hear. I pray for that one today that the enemy has had a heyday. <laughs> and just they, all they see is what he puts in front of them. If they know you, Lord, today, I pray that you fix them, that their rejoicing will be changed. And I need it. I very much need these reminders today. So use us, Lord, and we'll be careful to give you the praise, for we ask you to pray it in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, amen, amen. amen. You may be seated. Thank you. You know, first thing, and it's, it's, it's off from the sermon direction, but I think it's necessary in this passage. I thought it was really unique that if you go back to the beginning of the chapter, the first verse says that God, Jesus sent them out, the group out, he sent them in pairs, and he was sending them out and, it was, and they were going before him the direction that he would go. And it reads, you've got to go read that. It's pretty neat. And, and I thought about this. They were going and basically saying, hey, guys, Jesus is coming. <laughs> uh, next week, Jesus is going to be here. Uh, just come to tell you that uh, Jesus is behind me. He's coming. And I thought about this, and it's totally off, but I can't miss it to share this with you. You and I are on, have the same, we have the same duty today. I don't know about you. But there's a lot of signs. I don't know if you're, you realize how much of the signs of the times are everywhere. There is so much. The major players in prophecy that will, war will take place with Israel, they are in place today. And I'm not playing on, uh, on ignorance or anything like that. You can go study. It, 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 you can get way out in the weeds sometimes with it. But I'm just telling you, today could be the day, literally today could be the day that Jesus returns. I mean, that's how close I believe. And people say, well, they've been saying that for decades. Well, all I'll tell you is, said it for decades. He must be closer today than he used to be. Amen? So just know that. And just like these guys were saying Jesus is coming this way, you and I need to be reminded as followers of Christ, we need to be telling other people that Jesus is coming behind us. He's coming back. He truly is. All right? And uh, we've already taken up the offering. It won't cost you any more. All right? He is coming. Everyone wants happiness. Amen? Uh, how many of you remember, and I, I was amazed that this song came out in 1988. Bobby McFerrin, you probably don't remember that name. He was a, uh, maybe just a one-hit wonder, but his song, Don't Worry, Be Happy. In that Caribbean, I guess I got that right. I'm sure if I don't, my wife and my kids will tell me so. But that, it had that sort of beach Caribbean sound to it, Don't Worry, Be Happy. And it was a mega hit. I mean, it was. I think it struck a chord with everybody, is that we worry, and yet in the middle of worry, we need to be happy, all right? But happiness is a slippery slope. I've been in the ministry long enough where I, I can remember you stayed away from the word happiness because that was sort of a secular word. We need to spend more time talking about peace and joy instead of happiness. Happiness sounds like something you get at a car lot, you know what I'm talking about? And then you realize, oh, Lord, what have I done? But where's happiness found? If we talk about happiness today, where's it found? There's so many people that run after something and, and they have it and then they're not happy. They got to go do something else. So where in the world is, is it found in position? Is it found when everybody knows your name? Is, is that where happiness is found? Well, I, I tell you that what I see with that is responsibility comes with that. And uh, you can't hide from anybody when everybody knows you. What about power? What if you had, what if you had power? Do you suppose, does that make you happy? I've known some people that have had the labels and they had power and people listen to them, but they seem pretty miserable to me. So I know it's not in that. Maybe performance, but it's like the athlete that signs the $100 million contract. He can't wait to get $100 million more. And I'm thinking, how much money do you need? You got generational wealth and modern times. So, so I know performance even doesn't necessarily drive happiness. So where in the world do we find it? 
I did thought I'd interject for about 30 seconds. What makes me happy? <laughs> what makes me happy? Getting a, this, this is my little four point list. Please don't write them down. They won't be that deep. Okay. Number one is this getting along with folks makes me happy. My mama said, well, I was a, I was a, I wasn't even a teenager. She said I was a peacemaker. I just want peace. My kids can tell you now. I just want, I, I can't stand when my kids pit themselves against each other. And by the way, they do it a lot. It, so, I, so my happiness is hurt. They always have an issue, you know, but I like it. I like peace. I like when Suzanne and I are at peace and you know, I, I wish she'd work out a little more, I, but I like peace. You follow me? That, that's happiness to me. I, just, just be at peace. I like peace in church. You know, I don't like when somebody got an opinion about somebody. I, I don't know. I, I like peace. Mm. Then I think about this. I like, what makes me happy is my bills are paid. Nobody's coming to get me. And, and I'm not talking about extravagant stuff. Just know that, you know, this morning somebody didn't see a repo person to my, send a repo person to my house or something. I like my bills being paid. I, I like not owing somebody. Feel like somebody's, oh, well, he don't pay his bills. Early in ministry, I dealt with a lot of that. I had people tell me as a pastor, if you're going to be any kind of pastor, make sure you pay your bills. And then, you know, I've always thought, what are they really telling me? You know, you look into it, undoubtedly they knew pastors that didn't pay their bills. <laughs> That's what they're saying. And so I thought, man, so, so my bill's paid. I like this. I'm not a big steak eater, but right now I'd like a big juicy steak. If you'll, hurt, if you'll hush, preacher, I might go find me one. I, I'm sort of watching red meat, and the more I watch red meat because of cholesterol and all that kind of stuff, the, the more you want it. You know, it's just one of those things. What makes me happy last is that summer's coming, isn't it? Today's supposed to be the hottest day I think we've had this year. And, and uh, got up early yesterday morning, and there's been a few mornings the last week or two that very cool in the morning. It feels more like fall and spring than it does summer. But uh, I like a cool morning. That makes me happy. It just seems to be I, I love morning person, that kind of thing. What makes you happy? Some, there's, and there's a lot of confusion with that word today that if I go obtain something, if I go do something, that'll make me happy. But that stuff's fleeting. Solomon had it all. And he said that kind of stuff was fleeting and vexation of spirit, vanity and vexation of spirit. But Psalm 144, 15, it's really neat. It says, happy are the people with such blessings. Watch this. Happy are the people whose God is the Lord. This is, this is where people miss it. This is the reason the world's never satisfied. This is the reason that, as Paul said, godliness with contentment is great gain. Because when we get to a point where God desires for you and me to be happy, he, he desires for there to be a resolute thing within us. But I want to tell you something. It comes from the Lord. Happy are the people that are in the Lord. There, there's something, there's a, there's a substance there that you can't find anywhere else. So true. One of my heroes, C.S. Lewis. Uh, some of, one of the best writers, there's some big ones. I, I always, if I find a C.S. Lewis quote, you're going to see it if it applies to the sermon. Well, this one right here applies. This is the sermon, uh, what he said. He said, God cannot give us a happiness and peace apart from himself. Think about it now. God can't bless you in a way that is not part of who he is. You, you can't go get something or acquire something and be happy. Happiness is found in him. Watch what he says. He said, because it is not there, there is no such thing as true happiness outside of God. God bestows that upon us, all right? Ultimately, our happiness is terminal. It's just, it, it's substandard outside of God. That's why, and I don't, you didn't come to hear addictions and all that, but you always wondered, why does that somebody have to go do it twice? Why do they have to have another one and another one and another one? Because there's no substance. There's no sustaining power to happiness outside of God himself. And, and, and the writers, many places, so, so I want to do something today. I want to talk about happiness. And, and I got five points. I know that scares some of you to death because it takes me forever for three. But I just want to capture. I'm not going to stay on some of them that long, but I just want you, I want to define for you that what I think, and when you think of it, and it's according to this passage, sometimes we get off base in this arena of happiness. The, the first thing that comes to mind is happiness is found when we're saved, when we realize that we're in the family. I wrote it down this way. It's a decision that creates the destiny, destination. Many people think, that, well, everybody's going to heaven, aren't they? No, they're not. People that are going to heaven have made a decision for Christ. So the decision then determines my destination or the lack of. 
And you're going to see that again a couple of times. But see, it's about being born again. There's a change that, that place, takes place. <laughs> I trust you have. I trust that you know the Lord is your personal Savior. If not, we would love to meet with you. Because we are failing miserably if people could come to church, be involved, understand there's a standard or a belief, and yet don't know the Lord. And, and so if that, that pulls a heartstring, please seek us out, all right? Because happiness is found in being born again, I promise you. You'll hear more about that in a minute. Secondly, and it's according to this, it's in reference to this story, happiness is also being sent out. It truly is. Don't, admit, don't, don't just discard the event itself. Jesus sent out. Now, in this translation, there's a dispute. I remember it's gone on for decades, but people believe the original, some the original believe it was 70 that he sent out. This text says, this translation says 72. For, for, for discussion's sake, it's immaterial, all right? It's either 35 pairs or 36 pairs of people that he sent out beforehand as he was coming, as we've already established that. But he sent them out. And the reason I want to share that with you, happiness is found in doing something for someone else. I've challenged people over and over and over, tell me something that feels better than doing something for somebody where you didn't have to do it. God sent them out. I wrote it down for you to see a visual. It's I exist, you exist for other people. If we would get that, today, in today's life, this day, this 24-hour period, you exist to impact someone else. Hmm. The resources God gave you. You hear one of my favorite verses all the time. God gave me the things so that I would be able to give to him who needs. And so, old now in the scripture reminds us that I exist, you exist for other people. It's a great reminder, but we need to hear it every day. A couple of mornings ago, I got up, and, and uh, when I take a shower, I always take my, my pay it forward bracelet off and, and uh, my watch. And, and when I got to take a shower, I pulled, was going to take it off, and it broke. I sort of had a bad morning. It was just terrible. And so I kept it. It's in my truck. I said it could get close to me as it would. I had it in my pocket. Then I put it in my truck on the console, and, and I got me a new one this morning. And I just tell you this, this is not to look at somebody and say they're more or less, go they wear a bracelet. Why? Why? I'm not a, I'm not a bracelet wearer. Uh, I was grown before I ever put on a watch. Uh, I don't like that kind of stuff, but, but it's a great reminder. Paying it forward is about me ministering to someone else as I represent Christ. You and I live and breathe and exist to impact someone else with the gospel. You might not ever sit on the stage like this. You might not ever get loud like this with someone else in, in sharing something with them. But every one of us can pay it forward and minister to someone else for Christ. They were sent out, and you and I have been sent out by great commission for us to impact other people. Let me give you three more happinesses also. And this is a biggie. And to establish snakes and scorpions are subject. Happiness. What What in the world? I've given this one a lot of thought of all the sermon. This, this, this point was it for me, is that humanity needs to be reminded on a regular basis because there's so many worldly things out there, perspectives, that humanity is God's best creation. We were made in his image and his likeness. Think about that. See, we need to get, and I, the first service, it didn't go over well. I felt like there were people that were staring at me with daggers what I shared, I just, I felt like some, some resistance and I don't mean it badly, but, but I'm telling you folks in the world that we live in, I think one of the ploys of the enemy is for us to think that humanity is just like all of the rest of God's creation. And that's not the way it is. And I see things in our society that trouble me. They do. Uh, I've had animals. I've owned them. Uh, I buried them. It breaks my heart. Uh, I tell people I love dogs. Probably the most reason I love dogs is they don't talk back. <laughs> I heard a very famous person said, I want you to know that your dog loves you more than your, your wife does. The man said, I don't know if I agree with that. And he said, well, when you get home today, you put your dog and your wife in the trunk of the car for an hour. And when you open the trunk, tell me which one loves you more. <laughs> but I need to say this and just get by it because I want to establish a point here. We live in a very dangerous arena in our world today where if we don't watch it, we have equated animals to be the same as humans and humans to be the same as animals. I don't know if there'll be dogs and different animals in heaven. I got a feeling they will be. They're part of God's creation. But they don't have a soul and they've not been redeemed by Jesus Christ. I'm going to leave that to you and the Lord about the animal that you love so much. 
but there will never be an animal that will be the equivalency of a human being. And we need to understand that. Now, you can love them and do those kind of things, but Jesus didn't die for animals. He died for humanity. And you got to get this because I want to establish this thing. Here Jesus says, snakes and scorpions are subject to you. And I want to tie this together. You say, well, what, what's the point? Snakes and scorpions are not equal with me. That, that, that's the point. And yes, there's a negative connotation we'll talk about in a minute, but it needs to be established. Animals are not on the same level as humanity. And we talk about being redeemed. One of the things that God gave us, even as humanity before sin, God gave us dominion. All right. I'll show you this verse. In Genesis 1.26, it says this. Then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. They will rule the fish of the sea. That's the reason Bo and I go fishing. They will rule the birds of the sky. That's the reason if I get an invite to go dove hunting next fall, I'm going. All right. Never seen a dove fly over the dove field and shoot back. All right. The livestock. That's the reason you sit on them and, and you see that. And my son-in-law is a very talented horseman, but he gets on a horse and the horse obeys. And if the horse doesn't obey, he shows him dominion. All right? And so it's the world that we live in. You say, well, why is that? Why do we not see part of the creation then dominating us? Because part of the creation wasn't given dominion over mankind. Mankind was, get, been, was given it over, over the it, over the creation. And we need to get this, folks. He was all oh, Brother Jay, it's not important. It is important because there's things that are being shown out there today like we're trying to make us equal with birds and trees and animals and all that. And we're not equal. God died for me. He didn't die for them. Amen? Are you still out there? Don't worry. It's on Facebook, but it's not on you. But we need to hear this stuff. And we're getting further and further down the road, and it seems like the voice that should be crying in the wilderness has become very silent. And the more territory we give up, and people say, Breathe it. Brother Jay, it's not that big a deal. Yes, it is. Oh, it is, folks. And you just need to know it is, all right, and receive it, okay? There's another aspect to this thing. When I think about snakes and scorpions, this hit me. Just in study, I thought about the snake, and, and in Genesis 3.1, it says that the snake was the most cunning of all the animals. And I thought about a scorpion. <laughs> I thought about the pain. I, I've never experienced that, don't want to. But I've heard people talk about there's not much more pain you can have from an animal than a sting of a scorpion. And they're uniquely made, and it's amazing. But I began to just think about, okay, you got the pain of a scorpion, which is our life, and the cunningness of the, the serpent played on that with, with Lucifer himself, played on the mind of Eve and then with Adam and we're where we are today because we fell miserably because of the mindset. And I thought about, could it be that Jesus is just showing us another visual here that whether it's in your mind or in your life, nothing is, you're not subject to any of it in me. It should be under your feet. You should tread under it. There are times we're going along fine and something comes up. And man, we think the end of the world has come and the world's fallen on us and we just want to give up, throw up our hands and give up. I want to tell you today and remind you that if you know Jesus Christ, those things are under your feet because they're under his feet. Amen? And we need to get this. I'm going somewhere with this sermon, all right? He said, I don't know. You're not going anywhere in a hurry. But do we need to get this? Jesus said, the snakes and the scorpions are subject to you. They should be under your feet. Don't give them more place in your life. Sometimes people can't do anything because something comes up and it owns them. I've seen it too many times. It owns them. Whatever comes in your life, it didn't come to stay. It came to pass. Amen? I'll just get excited up here by myself. We're talking about rejoicing. It's okay. We need to hear this. We need to toughen up sometimes. Yes, the enemy comes in, but bless God, he's not the winner. We give him more territory than we should. And we're going to get to that next. Then what did he say? Satan has no authority. Huh. No, no authority in your life. Well, Brother Jay, what about if something happens? Hmm. In Christ, you're bigger than it is. Huh? How about that? Doesn't mean we have to deal with it. Doesn't matter. It has tentacles and all kinds of things. We got to, issues got to deal with. Brother Man, we says, we can win. There's no doubt about it. We're winners because we know him. He was victorious, and we can be also. So, so well, there's just something. Let me tell you something. People say, well, there's just some things. The enemy just, he just owns me. 
Or you might need an address change. Hmm. You, you might need a friendship change. You, you, you might need to quit hanging out there and hanging out with them or doing whatever. If you want to change, I guarantee you, you can do it. You got to do it. Is it going to be easy? No. Most time we have to fill up the hole just like we dug it. But Satan has no authority. It's been settled. We are part of the family. <laughs> and even say, Satan himself is subject to you and me. I love Westerns. This just came to mind. It's not in my notes. I love Westerns. I really do. I guess the reason I love Westerns is because I've never seen a Western that the bad guy won. Most of the time, he's laying in a puddle of blood in the middle of the street when it goes off. And we're all celebrating that the good guy wins. I, I guess that's the reason I like Westerns. The more the merrier. I'll watch one today, good Lord willing. Listen to me. Satan has no authority. If he's chewing on you, you've allowed him to put his teeth in you. Because greater is he that's within us than he that's in the world. It'll take a minute, but I want to show you a passage today. I'm trying to hurry, but I feel really slow. Romans chapter 6. Look at this. Now, if we die with Christ, we believe that we also will live with him. Because we know that Christ, having been raised from the dead, will not die again. Isn't that great news? <laughs> Death no longer rules over him. For the death he died, he died to sin once for all time, but the life he lives, he lives to God. So you too consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you, may, you obey its desires. Huh. And do not offer any parts of it to sin as weapons for unrighteousness, but as those who are alive from the dead, offer yourselves to God and all the parts of yourselves to God as weapons for righteousness. Last verse. For sin will not rule over you. Wow. Because you are not under the law but under grace. So, so I need to establish this and then I, I promise I'll move on. Well, well Brother Jay, what if, something, what if something's owning me? It's going to hurt. We're allowing it to own us. The only thing I hear in here is the air conditioners. I do believe that we've allowed things in our life so much that we have somehow conjured in our mind that this is the best I can do. Hmm. Maybe we need to pray for God to change. I'm going somewhere. Let me show you one more. I won't stay here long at all. All right? The victory's been won. Listen to this. F the last one. Situations of life don't control us. I know this sounds just like all the others. I, I just wanted to say it. And I wrote it down this way. We are guilty that we observe and even empower life matters that we should have victory over. I'm glad this is being recorded on Facebook. You can go back and listen to it. We have power over them. Don't worship. And I don't want to miss this. Don't worship them and don't worry or fret over them. God's in control. Something comes up and we worry and fret like we don't even name his name. Hmm. Wow. We worry and fret over things that come up. And maybe sometimes we allow it to stay in our life and it's almost like a mode of worship in our life. We spend more time validating something in our life that doesn't bring glory to the Lord instead of walking in the victory we have in Christ. Oh, listen. All of us have things that we go through, Sure. Here's where I want to close. Don't get too excited. It'll take a minute. But you know, Jesus didn't leave it there, did he? He didn't just give them this list of things that they were victorious over, but this is what he said in verse number 20. I mean, in Luke uh, chapter 10, verse 20. Look at it. He said, however, okay? <laughs> Remember, they came to him and said, the demons are subject to us. We got power. We say something and they have to do it. <laughs> we got power. We're somebody. That's when Jesus gave him, gave him this list that I just shared with you. And this is what he said, don't rejoice. He said, don't rejoice that the spirits submit to you. Watch this. But rejoice that your names are written in heaven. Get this, folks. Now, you can, everything else I've said today, you can just lay aside, okay? Especially if you love animals, and I just basically told you you shouldn't love them that much or whatever you got out of it. But all that, just lay it aside because I want us to do, I, I want us to have rejoicing practice the next five or ten minutes, okay? Listen to me. Rejoice. Hmm. 
when something seems uncertain in your life, rejoice. When despair and despondency seem to be the prevalent path of your life, rejoice. When pressure to perform and personal opinions evaluate your every move, rejoice. When life changes come in like a flood, rejoice. When God's way, oh, I like this one. I'm going to say this a couple of times. I did it in the first service. When God's way looks like it's losing to the worldview, rejoice. That, that's for me. I got to admit, all the rest of them apply, but that was so me because I look around and I go, man, can we have one more crazy messed up thing that comes out and people... I mean, can we have one more thing in our world that looks like we bow down to and it's so far from God's word? And yet I go, man, we're going, as my mother said, we're going to hell in the handbasket in our world. And I mean, the world view just looks like it's coming in and we can't push it back. And God's view seems to be so far. Oh, that's so crony. That's so old. That's such a square peg living on a round world. We, we need to get something new. We need to have reformation. You need to be progressive. The worldview looks like it's just overwhelming God's view. Let me tell you something. You know what we're supposed to do? Rejoice. Because my redemption draws now. Rejoice. Because one day, not too long from now, I believe with everything about me, it could be this afternoon, the trump of God's going to sound. And the dead in Christ are going to be raised. And immediately we which are alive and remain will be caught up together with him in the clouds. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Hmm. Rejoice. God didn't bring us this far to let us down or let us go. Rejoice. I got to give you some things to rejoice about today. They're just some obvious matters. First is to remind you there is a book. <laughs> he said, remember, he was to rejoice that your name is written. Referencing our name is in the book. <laughs> it's really simple. This is what our life is boiled down to, reduced to. I just need to make sure my name's in the book. Hmm. Secondly, I want to remind you that you have a name. God said that your name would be in the book. I'm so glad that we're not going to, to heaven corporately. We're not going congregationally. We're not going, we're going by name. One day the book is going to be open and he's going to find my name and I'm going because my name is in the book. Not because of what I've done, but because of what Christ has done for me. Just want to make you aware of that. To go to heaven, here's an obvious matter. You've got to get your name in the book. <laughs> well, how in the world do you do that? You know him personally. You know why we ought to have a rejoice. Because I'm God's child. Everybody's name who was found is in the book is going to the celestial with Almighty God forever. 